Moto America fans, it's time for another episode of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you may even learn something from this unlikely pair and their special guest. The mic is yours, Paul and Sean. Good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is for you Moto America fans listening to Off Track. It's our weekly podcast with myself. I'm Paul Carruthers, the communications manager for Moto America. I'm joined, as always, by Sean Bice, who is our resident storyteller on the Moto America staff. He's not really staff, but we pay him, so it's got to be somewhat staffy. But uh, <laughs> our, our, And our guest today, I'm pretty excited. I'm always, it's always nice to talk to David Anthony. He's, uh, he's a lot more Australian than I am because he was there for longer than I was, but we both share a little bit of, uh, of Aussie pride. Um, David was 10th in our Moto America Superbike Championship this year. He, uh, he kind of peaked a little early at his best result in the first race of the season at Coda, where he finished sixth. Um, he had a lot of uh, uh, all top 10 finishes, at least in the races that he did finish in. He had a good year. Um, one of the things about uh, David that makes him different, other than the fact that he's from Australia, and uh, is the fact that he has his own team. So much along the lines of, uh, of your Kyle Wyman's. Uh, of the world. David uh, is not only the team owner, but also the lead rider. Um, he always has at least one other rider with him. We'll, we'll talk to him about what his plans are for 2020. He's also a big Moto America proponent. He's been with us since the beginning, and uh, he's always good to have on. He, he thinks highly of Moto America, and, and you know, if he didn't, we just wouldn't have him on, I guess. Right, Sean? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, he's he's a good person to have on this time of time of year to talk about some things. Um, lots of good questions we've got for for David, and he's always so upfront and open about stuff. Um, hey, before we get started, you mentioned storyteller. Um, I I don't know if I've got a story as much as I'm going going to digress a little, and I've been known to digress a little bit. So, um, but uh, n- now that we've got the now that we've got the Christmas holiday passed and we're moving close to the New Year holiday, one of the things I always look forward to every year is on the Sci Fi Channel. Paul, I don't know if you are into this or if you watch it, but every year the Sci Fi Channel has this uh, Twilight Zone marathon. It's all the old Twilight Zone shows that I absolutely love. The fact that they're black and white are awesome too, and it seems like whenever I watch that, I don't ever watch the whole thing. It goes for twenty four hours, obviously. Um, and there seems to be always an episode that I, I haven't seen and I thought I've seen them all, but, um, do you, do you what, do you know about that age of the twilight zone? Did you ever watch any of that stuff? I mean, that was a different world for you then, but yeah, I haven't watched the marathon, but I've definitely watched the show. Um, I remember it, uh, I remember it very well from, I don't know how old, how old I would have been, but there are probably reruns at the time, but, uh, no, it's, it's, it's always a, it's a fascinating show to watch and it kind of makes you think about some stuff. And like you said, it's always cool to watch some old black and white stuff like that. And Paul, you grew up in, you know, a whole different set of circumstances from me in terms of being in other countries or whatever. But are, did you watch the old Twilight Zones? And are you familiar with this marathon that, that they have? Yeah, I'm not familiar with the marathon. I didn't know they had that, but it's kind of good to know because if I don't have much going on. That's something maybe I can do. But I do remember the show. Um, I would have watched it only here. I don't know if that would have been uh, repeats or what, but I know that it was, uh, it was in black and white and it was always, it was always fun to watch. It kind of made you think about some things and I think it'd be even more fun to watch it, uh, watch it again now. So maybe I'll give that a shot. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff. I mean, it shows a lot of actors when they first started out and things, but the reason I bring it up um, and my digressing away is it, it actually comes back to a reason for bringing this up. Speaking of marathons, I was delighted to find out that we are doing an all day marathon for all of our superbike races on FS2. Uh, that's so cool, Paul. I, people can just totally binge watch the season. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think it's really cool. Um, we found out kind of late, but obviously in time. But uh, we, I don't think we even knew that it was, it was going to happen. So it was pretty cool when we got the news. But uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can wake up on, uh, on Sunday which is December 29th and basically watch nine hours straight of uh, Moto America Superbike, which it, it'd be fun to find out who actually can sit there for nine hours. Cause uh, I, I'm not sure I could sit still for that long, <laughs> but I think it's, it, it's kind of cool because 
you know, like you said, you brought up the Twilight Zone one and you always see these uh, these marathons and stuff. And to, and to think that we've uh, we've come far enough that we have one of those ourselves on on FS2 is, is very cool. So, yeah, I'm I'm anxious to see uh, what kind of response we get. And, and like I said, we need to have like a, a fan contest for somebody who can prove that they actually sat there for nine hours without uh, without <laughs> stopping. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to have people reach out to us on social media and have us have us see them uh, watching it and stuff. But um, what one person I want to find out if if he is going to watch the marathon is David Anthony. David, uh, welcome to the sh- uh, podcast, the show. And uh, are you going to sit and watch that thing on the 29th um, to, to see yourself running around the track? Uh, it's not normally <laughs> something I enjoy doing. It's kind of... Uh... Like when people listen to themselves talk, you you don't want to hear that. Oh, yeah. It's just like I don't want to see myself I hear ride. You. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no doubt about he's, it. I hear what you're saying. He he he's lived through all nine hours of that. He doesn't need to do it again. <laughs> um. So, D- David, welcome to uh, the podcast. This is the second time we've had you on, and uh, really great to have you on during the off season, so we can kind of talk about. What's what's going on in your world, and maybe you can tell us what you might have planned for next year. But um, you know, it's a little bit of a contrast. We had Chuck Jacetto last week, who is is team manager for Westby Racing, and you know they have a pretty well funded program. And and your your program, I'm not saying it's not well funded, but you've been doing it a long time, and I think you have a different whole tactic with what you do and how you you know you you activate your sponsors the way any other team does, and you have some pretty loyal sponsors that have been with you, but. You know, tell us about your team and your your ideas of you know behind being in Superbike and wh- what it all means to you for us. Yeah, I mean, you you started off. You mentioned uh, Chuck with Westby. You know, his his program is from the outside is kind of a low key effort, and they you know put all the effort into you know performance on the track. Uh, from the outside, my effort looks like a big effort, and. Yeah, you would think we would try to put effort in on the track, but unfortunately, you know, the budget we work with, uh, a lot of that is dictated by, you know, and spent and allocated in terms of the infrastructure we have. You know, the sponsors we have want to see us, you know, rolling down the road in a big truck and and having lots of bikes on the track and, and so forth. So, yeah, definitely two different uh, structured teams in how we work. You know, I would, uh, I'd love to sit here and say, yeah, we go racing to uh, try and get results and win races. But, you know, realistically, we're out there just to, I mean, it's a, it's a job for me, you know, and that's how, how it's got to be run. It's, uh, you know, racing as a racer, you always want to, that's why you do it. You want to win. You want to be the best. And I'd love to go racing every weekend under those circumstances. But yeah, it's turned into a business and, you know, you got to do what you got to do, and it's much better than uh, sitting at a desk every day. So, no, I'm happy. <laughs> it's going good. Good. What are the plans for this year, David? I mean, do you have? Obviously, we can always count on you going racing, and we can always count on somebody else, um, at least one rider other than yourself in the team. What, what do we have a firm plan in place for this coming season? Uh, you know, it's not even certain that I will ride. Um, you know, I've said for years that. Uh, well, obviously, I'm getting old. Lots of uh, people in the paddock call me old. But I'd, I'd personally, I, I'd personally fight them on that since I'm older. Yeah, but you're really old. I'm just old. <laughs> <laughs> Merry, so, Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas. For uh, for yeah, for quite a number of years now, I've always said if I could afford to put a rider on the bike that's better than me, I would do it in a heartbeat, and I would step away and, and run the program. I believe it would work a lot better if I was just running the program and not actually riding. But yeah, it's always a matter of, you know, if I'm to put a better rider than myself on, I'm going to have to pay him a paycheck and that's just not in the budget. Mm. So I'm still, you know, every year I work on ways to put someone else on the bike and but just like I'm doing at the moment and yeah, nothing is set in stone yet. And just working towards that, that goal, we'll be out there. We'll have at least one or two bikes on the track as normal, but who's on it and what brand and everything, you know, still up in the air at the moment. With the current climate of having less teams, I mean, it sort of puts you in a position where if you could 
scrape together the funding that you could get yourself a, a good rider. I mean, is that correct? Yes, definitely. There's lots of uh, options out there for riders. There's you know plenty of good riders at the moment. Um, I'm very picky though as to who I would want to work with, you know, because I've got to this point basically by hard work and commitment and dedication and as you know any rider should have to get to this point and there's a lot out there that just in my opinion don't quite have that drive that you need to you know for the whole package right so unfortunately i think the days are gone where you can just be a rider and you know perform and that's all it takes now it's a it's got to be a whole package so and this business for me we'll call it you know, it's, I'm not getting rich. I'm just getting by. I enjoy it. That's why I do it. So it's definitely got to be a good fit and a, and a rider that I get along with. And, you know, they got to, and probably, you know, another big factor in that is because the team's not funded, you know, like it really needs to be, there's certain circumstances where you're not going to get what you need. Uh, you're going to have to deal with something that's not quite right. Uh, there'll be less crew than you need. So it has to be a rider that is able to adapt and, you know, happy to work under those those conditions. And, you know, I wouldn't expect a, a top rider coming from a factory team to, you know, work under those conditions. That would be very hard for them. So, yeah, it's a hard spot to fill for sure. David, one question I want to ask you about is I think it's pretty incredible and very cool about your team that over several years now, you've had Fly Racing USA as a sponsor and you've done a great job with, like you say, the truck rolling down the road. I mean, it's a great billboard with that brand on it. And of course, your own ADR Motorsports brand. But um you know, you've seemed to have done a great job with Fly. I don't know what it looks like in the future for you, but is it is it year to year with them and do you um you you must have a great relationship with those guys they must be pretty happy with what you do for them is is that tr- correct uh yes they i mean obviously it's i think it's about 14 years we've been going now um, wow it's a good relationship but again from the outside a lot of people think that you know it's a big relationship and lots of money changes hands uh it doesn't and that's why the relationship has been so long because i do a lot for them for a little Mm -hmm. um you know it's not a great model for the sport i believe that i'm underselling myself but on the flip side it's created a long-term thing and they're happy and i'm happy and we're able to put a team out there every year so i mean that's what's important so yeah i'm happy to i guess sell myself cheap sometimes to to make it work and yeah that's why fly is still there well you know the thing with that too that brand i want to say and this 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 goes out to any of the team sponsors that we work with and i'm talking from moto america's point of view in our social media i'll give you an example whenever we talk about you we always say fly racing usa and they have tags on instagram or facebook so whenever it's anything related to you we get you get get you in there i know you do the same thing but my point is um they they always thumbs up things. So they, they like seeing their tag related to you. So what I'm saying is you, you know, you, you do a lot for them and it extends out through the paddock too. And I'm not trying to get us to Moto America to take credit for it. But what I'm saying is the, the teams that we have that have these brands, we are delighted to help, you know, raise all ships and promote them as well. So um, and, it, and it comes back to to pay those, you know, or at least to to show exposure for those sponsors that you guys have. Um, it's it's just a great relationship, and you know, we we love to have Fly Racing involved, and I think it's so cool. Your bike, your delivery on your bikes is always so very noticeable. I, I just think it's great. And the other thing, David, I, I think you do a great job for Kawasaki too. You've been running that bike for a while, and you you don't have any necessary allegiance to them other than the fact that you've been running that bike and. Um, you know, you're one of the Kawasaki's out there and it's, it is very noticed. So, um, I, I just want to, want to tell you that just, uh, keep it going, whether you're in the seat or not, but, um, you know, the fact that you're going to continue, we, we knew you were going to transition at some point, maybe, maybe not quite yet, but, um, I'm glad you're going to kind of continue, uh, as a team owner and, and be out there, whether you're in the seat of the bike or not. So it's very cool. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of why, you know, I want to speak to you guys today just to point out that, you know, hey, 
there is, I'm certainly not the only person that's capable of running a team and putting bikes on the track every year. You know, it's, there's plenty of people out there that can do exactly what I do. So yeah, I'm happy to share any information I have so that maybe people can look at it and go, Hey, you know, that's an option for me. Maybe I could uh, do something like that. Now, one thing I think that's different from you than I don't want to point to Kyle Wyman again, but let's just point to Kyle Wyman because he is a team owner that actually races, but you do a lot of, I mean, when I walk past your awning, I mean, there's a lot of times when your elbows deep in, in the motorcycle itself. And it, you've been doing that from day one, right? Yeah. I've, I mean, that's how I first got into motorcycles was I was, you know, I started as a motorcycle mechanic. So, you know, luckily I'm, I've learned the skills over the years to be able to basically perform every task that's involved on the race team. So that enables to, you know, us to keep the budget down. Uh, you know, I'm able to do a lot of tasks. So yes, I'm always, always right in there, always doing a lot of stuff. Um, I believe Kyle does quite a lot as well. Yeah, I think so too. But yeah, but it, it and it, it probably makes you crash less when you got to fix it yourself, right? <laughs> when, when you know exactly what it costs and that you're gonna, you're not gonna go to dinner tonight because you're gonna have to stay and work on that bike. It's, uh, it's amazing the effect it does have. Yes. Yeah, I, that's why I think I've noticed you and Kyle, when you crash, you tend to like lay under the bike as much as you, as much as you can and kind of nurse it into the air fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever you can to save some dollars for sure. Everything you can. Now, David, this past year you had Bradley Ward in Stock 1000 and you were you were in Superbike. Can you, for people, there? Oh, I talk to Stock 1000 riders, I talk to fans of Stock 1000 and you know, the, the, the difference between a stock 1000 bike and a super bike, um, you have an intimate knowledge in that because you kind of ran both. So can you, can you tell me, um, is it, is it a huge jump into super bike? Why can't the stock 1000 riders say, I'll just run in super bike this year and get the big forks or the, the, the triple clamps or whatever. Can you, can you tell us about the difference between those two classes and from a little bit of a monetary point of view? Yes, you hear that all the time. You know, the super stock guys and a lot of people saying super bike racing is too expensive. Um, as you guys know, I do a lot of club racing and stuff as well, um, which I do on – I have a stock bike and I have my super bike. So I quite often ride them back to back at, during the same day. And quite often I'm, I don't know, 0.5 to 0.7 of a second difference between my super bike and my stock bike. Hmm. So we're not – I mean, on a racetrack, yeah, half a second's a lot, but we're not talking uh, earth-shattering amounts of difference here. It's not like a stock bike's going to be uncompetitive. You know, there's certain circumstances where it works almost as good as my superbike. So, yeah, and to then, you know, there's only a few extra parts to put on a superbike that you need to get that last half a second. And, you know, once that investment's made in a set of forks and some wheels and, and stuff like that, it's you're basically running the same program with a few extra tires. So no, I don't really agree with all the, how expensive super bike racing is. Uh, I mean, one, one thing which we could argue about for hours is the electronics thing, mm -hmm. which lots of people do argue about for hours. <laughs> um, I'm the, I believe I'm the only one out there running, still running kit electronics. or maybe myself and um, Peterson, the rest are on, you know, either Motec or Morelli. So, yeah, that, that's another jump again. And, you know, I'm not saying that I'm losing anything by not running that stuff, but, you know, there's a possibility there's more time in that. No, to, in a roundabout way to sum up your question, not a huge difference between the bikes in terms of performance. And I would, you know, for next year, for example, I'm probably have a stock bike as my backup bike in case anything goes wrong. What the, with the electronics is, is, is the issue that would stop you from making that next step monetary or is it the having somebody that knows how to get the most out of it and you feel like sometimes you could take a step backwards by actually doing it? Yes. I mean, that, that answer is, is both <laughs> hand in hand. Um, the, the, the money to actually invest in the system is not crazy. The money to pay the right person starts to get, you know, up there quite a bit. Um, you know, when you're talking, when every time I get on the bike, I basically need that person there, you know, it starts to get quite expensive. So that is the main holdup 
is the having the personnel to run it. I am, you know, slowly trying to educate myself on that kind of stuff. And obviously, as I transition into team owner only, I've, you know, if I've got that skill, that's a huge, huge advantage to have. So slowly working on it, but yeah, I'm not confident that I would have the knowledge to go, yeah, let's run this system and and be competitive with it. But working in that direction. Well, I, think, I think it's something to shoot for because, I mean, you're obviously a smart enough guy. And if you do make that transition, it'd be kind of cool to be the team owner guy that also had such a big role in the team that you were actually running the electronics. And I think it'd probably just take a bit of time to, to get it sorted out. And I think that should be your goal for next winter. <laughs> it's uh it's a work in the progress at the moment actually i'm i'm hoping to start doing some testing with maybe a motec system uh in the next month or so wow. and like i said i'm not expecting it to be any better but yeah we'll start start with it david in the five years that moto america has been around you've been involved the entire time and you've seen initially we had super stock or super stock 1000 bikes on track at the same time as Superbike. Now we've got a Stock 1000 class. So just back to the Stock 1000 versus Superbike kind of thing. Do you do you like having a Stock 1000 class for your team and for what you're trying to do? Um, and, or would you prefer it to be all together? You know, tell us about from your team perspective, how what, what you feel about that. I mean, my team, just in terms of my team and my sponsors and how it works, it honestly doesn't really matter. My personal opinion is that I would like to see more bikes on the grid mm-hmm. in Superbike. So if there was a way to combine them and put everything together, that would be what I would like to see. Um, but no, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. You know, <laughs> Sorry. Well, let, me, let me tell you what I was getting at. I didn't know, for instance, we'll just say fly, fly racing. Is it a benefit to them that you can say, hey, I've got a rider that's out on the track for two entire – well, depending on the weekend, but a stock 1000 race, a couple of super bike races, you've got more than one race that you're showing, you're activating and showing their brand on the track or on TV, uh, in photos, however it's done. So does that, does that benefit you in that you've kind of, you've spread out their brand a little bit of over a couple of classes? Now, honestly, in my situation, yeah. probably not. It would probably be better just to have more bikes in super bike than spread across okay. different classes. Yeah, and that was that was a kind of a part B. I didn't know if you would ever, you know, you've you've kind of concentrated on leader bikes, uh, super bike for sure. But you know, have you have you ever thought about having anything from Junior Cup to Super Sport or a Twins Cup? Would you ever consider having a rider under your tent that would be in a class like that? Do you think? Yeah, definitely. If I was in a position, you know, financially and had the right rider, um, I would put. I would be happy to run any class. You know, I. I said I got into racing because I want to be competitive. You know, if, if the opportunity is there to run up the front in any class, then I'm all over it. I'm uh, I'm constantly trying to come up with ways to, yeah, you know, put different classes out there, work with with good riders, and yeah, it's an ongoing uh, thought for sure. On your average race weekend, what what what's the most difficult task for you from the time you leave the shop to the time you finish the race? I mean, is there is there is there any part of it that's more difficult than than another, or or something that takes more of your time? Or it, I'm just trying to get to the point. Am I? I mean, there's so much that goes on for you compared to a guy that just flies in and and puts his leathers in the truck and and starts to clean his face shield. Yeah, it's it's, it's definitely you know you look at at some of the bigger teams. I don't know how many full time staff members they got, but there's quite a few in some of the people I'm racing against. And you know, there's there's one full time staff member on this team, and that's me. And that basically runs until we turn up at the track, either to test or to race. And then I have you know another four or five guys join me for the weekend. Um, but in terms of the, yeah, it's it's just the whole weekend in package as a package. I just get burnt out. It's just you know one thing after another, and you get to the. You know, for a while there, I was actually staying at the track. But I get to the end of the day and I just need to get away. So now I always, you know, mm-hmm. make sure I go to a hotel, get away from it and just, just get a break because it's, you know, it's my whole life. And basically I work towards those race weekends and then they get there and, you, you know, everything you put in is about right now. So it gets overwhelming. So not, nothing in particular, nothing like that, but just, just in general, just, just burnt out, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah, it just all adds up. <laughs> I got to yeah. change subjects for a minute. This- but but I'm not yeah I'm not complaining. No, I wouldn't think you are, David. The amount of time, the longevity you've been in, had in the series, and I mean, you can still see that the fire burns in you, even to hear you talk about the different classes in Moto America. Um, hey, I want to change subjects real quick to something that I was delighted by. We recently did that story about this imaginary gift exchange that we did between the superbike riders. And and David, when I got in touch with you, one of the two things you were, I, you, you, well, let's say in quotes, air quotes, you drew Cam Peterson's name. And I didn't know what I was going to get from you, but I... I thought it was funny that you had two different things. One of them was you wanted to get him a phone because you said clearly his is broken um, because it always takes a few days, if at all, for him to respond. I laughed so hard about that because I actually ha- had Cam Peterson, you know, we had him get you something and I never heard from him. So I don't know if you know, read the story or saw where I said, no response, see David Anthony, second gift above. So you predicted the fact that you have to get him a phone and he didn't even respond to me because he needs a phone. So, so that was a perfect thing, David. Thank you for doing that. I've, I've given that, I've yeah. given that so, um, kid so much crap about his phone. I mean, I'll, I'll text yeah, so, him or call him, and I hear from him. You know, it could be two <laughs> weeks later. You know exactly. You know, I'm. Uh, you know, let's Cameron. I don't know if he would like to have a spot on my team or not. And I wouldn't be offended <laughs> if he said no. But me as a team owner, talking about putting riders on a bike, you know, I would, <laughs> I would expect a phone call back instantly if, uh, you know, someone in my position <laughs> was trying to reach out and contact him. <laughs> But I don't know. The, like I said, he's probably not interested, so that's fine. But if he is, he's so, uh, shooting himself so in the note foot. to Cam Peterson if you're <laughs> listening, which who knows, probably he's not. He certainly isn't listening on his phone since he doesn't have one. But, uh, hey, you can call David Anthony about next no. year maybe. So, <laughs> but, David, real quick, I want you to – can you explain for the – uh, for the listeners and those that read the article about the other part of it that you wanted to get a bucket for him. Can you explain that? So, cause people probably don't understand what that was all about either. Just tell us that story. <laughs> yeah, that, um, it started at Laguna when he was, when he was writing for me, he, um, was having some issues with nutrition and he was having fatigue issues and getting sick. And, um, then the following event at Sonoma, he was actually, on track and threw up, <laughs> vomited on the bike on the track <laughs> while he was riding around. So yeah. Pulled into pit lane with the bike covered in uh, <laughs> in, his, in his vomit. Well, that's where that comes from. <laughs> that's when team ownership is this fun. The hose. <laughs> yeah, and uh, every everyone made and him clean. It. No one touched it. his helmet. I would assume oh, too, oh, right? Oh. His helmet had to be a disaster too. I would. <laughs> well, yeah, that's. That's scary. Um, That's funny. Uh, David, uh, I can't remember last time we had you on if we talked to you about this, but you have not, you've been in the United States for a long time, but still, have you been in the United States longer than you were in Australia yet? Or are you, how old were you when you came over? Well, it's it's getting close. Uh, I left Australia when I was 20. And then spent a few years in Europe and then come here. So in total time away from Australia, I'm almost equal, but not quite there in uh, how long spent in America versus Australia. Okay. That's what I was thinking. The fact that you've been, you know, I was kind of adding it up, not that I'm great in math or anything, but um, you've been over here a long time and obviously this is your uh, home and probably I, I think we, you told us before that it will be, I mean, you got family here and everything. What did you, I want to ask you about Christmas. Um, did you, do you get in touch with people back home? How does that work with, uh, your relatives in Australia? Yeah. So on the, on the friend side over the years, that's, that's dwindled away to, yeah, basically got one good friend in Australia who I spoke to on Christmas day. So he's the only one Mm. left. Uh, my family, you know, I've got mum and dad over there and my brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not really too in contact with my brother. Uh, mum calls me every couple hours every day. Of course. <laughs> um, so yeah, she, uh, with, with the kids and everything on Christmas, yeah, she was constantly on the phone and Skype and video chat all day long. So a lot of contact with mum and dad. Uh, and that's about it. That's all there is. They... Last year they were here for Christmas, but this year they couldn't come. But yeah, normally once a year we see them. 
Yeah. Which isn't a huge difference from a lot. I mean, I'm the same way, except I, you know, I've got a distance from my parents, but it's not flying distance, it's driving. So I, I hear you, it gets to the point where, you know, you talk to them more, you talk to them all the time on the phone, but visiting them is a different thing. But I wondered with you, but being over here, as long as you have, I mean, you, you, uh, you still got a solid accent, unlike Paul that uh, doesn't have any, but um, you hang on to that accent. I, I, I love it. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm not yeah. sure how that, how that happens. I don't spend much time in Australia. I don't speak to many Australians, but just it, it sticks in there. I think you've had it long enough that it doesn't go away, and I didn't have it long <laughs> enough. So, And I tried to make mine go away. I, I was getting teased by every kid in San Diego, so I tried to ditch it as fast as I could, and now I wish I could get it back. <laughs> yeah. but. That was just an easy yeah. <laughs> um, Well, Paul, I've, been, I've got one more, que- one more big question for David. Uh, but I don't want to go ahead and I'll, uh, I'll kind of follow up with this because it's, it's kind of a wacky question. So you go ahead, Paul, if you got something. I don't have too much more for him. I just, I just want to tell him, you know, how happy we are that he continues to support our series. And he's a big part of our series. And it's nice to have somebody that we can always count on. And, uh, and just the fact he speaks so highly of, of Moto America and continues to, uh, to make his living there, I think it's very cool. And, and uh, I, I hope he never goes away. I'm, I'm, I, as much as I like to see him ride on the track, I know how difficult it is for him to do both those jobs. My father ran into the same thing at the end of his career. He just he got to the point where his riding became so small of a part of what he could think about that he just eventually said, you know, I can't do this anymore. I've just got to make that transition full time, which he did. So I kind of it's funny because my my dad and David kind of have a lot in common as far as not just being from Australia, but just the fact that they work on their own stuff and they always have. And, and that, uh, you know, David will eventually make the same transition that my dad did. So I always, uh, I always enjoy seeing him and I always pull for him to get good results. So that's, that's basically all I have. So go ahead and, uh, <laughs> feed us your last question that I'm sure is going to be overly, overly lengthy. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it's off the wall. So what I want to find out about David is uh, question, question about, uh, your wife, Crystal. I was, uh, so we do these throwback Thursdays and I go back through some of the photos and, and I, I know she worked with Yamaha and I've seen some photos of her w- on the podium with Yamaha's team. And I know she's been involved in racing. We've talked to you about that before, but one of the things I thought I saw on Facebook and this was from her and you can, this is a, your chance to talk about it and brag about her. Was she in some kind of, she was named like Mrs. Inland Empire of some year. She won some contest or pageant. Is this correct? Uh, you're asking the wrong person about that. <laughs> and you should so know about it. It started with, with my... Go ahead. No, I know all about it. I just don't really enjoy it or agree with it. <laughs> um, it started with my daughter doing, you know, a lot of pageants and stuff like that. And, yeah, so she enjoys doing that and Crystal's always there and they had this this other one, you know, for old ladies, I guess. And, um, <laughs> she... Uh, she won't listen to this. It's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, so she entered in that and, and won that one. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm I'm too. I guess you know, for her, it's competing, and it's it's kind of like what I do. You know, she competed yeah. and she won. But a lot of it is so set up and staged, and uh, it's, it's not my thing. But yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, she won. Congratulations. She did very good. <laughs> I, guess I did ask the wrong person that question. I swear it was Cam, Cam Peterson's sister, Shay, said something like, tell us something, whatever, that you're proud of or whatever. And I think Crystal answered it and said, yeah, I was Mrs. Inland Empire. <laughs> That's like, oh, I got to ask David about that one. That's so, but I guess I shouldn't have. So. <laughs> sorry. sorry, David. Well, good for her. <laughs> I'm no, proud. I, I get in trouble for not supporting her all the time. <laughs> Well, she, she, yeah, well, that's, that's a common trait with men, (laughs) but but man, she's always in the paddock, right? I mean, she's, she's, she goes with you to every round, right? I mean, she's always there, isn't she? Yeah. Most of the time, you know, when I first got here, obviously she was quite significant in the paddock and it was always, oh, you're, um, Crystal's husband, but now it's (laughs) turned to she's Ozzy Dave's wife. Well, No, I'm the, that's, I'm the well, predominant way, one. Way to turn that around. I mean, you know, from, from men to men, we're happy that you made that happen. So good job, David. <laughs> so, um, is there, is there anything you want to. Lucky I answered that question just before, cause she just come down and sat next to me. So 
Oh shit! Got in trouble. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> time is everything like now now she'll listen <laughs> she probably heard you saying it and then i'm like um I, yeah maybe <laughs> yeah there, there's <laughs> yeah, some please. stuff i want to add you know um, add it. it's all yours yeah, <laughs> you know paul paul mentioned how i'm you know supportive of motor america and i think you guys both know that i you know tell the truth i'm not gonna hold back and <laughs> and just praise you guys if i didn't believe it but yeah, you know, a lot of uh, stuff out there at the at the moment, social media with some of the teams pulling out and restructured and everything like that. Uh, one thing I've seen a lot is it mentioned how Moto America doesn't look after the riders and the teams, which to me is I, I can't understand that at all because you know I've been you know obviously I haven't been around as long as the Ulriches and the and the Dons and the Yoshimura and all that, but. I've been around, you know, going on 15 years and Moto America, what they do for the riders and the teams is, is unbelievable compared to what we've had in the past. You know, uh, I, my, what I do myself, you know, I wouldn't be able to go racing. It's, um, you know, it's what Moto America brings to the table as well that creates a platform to me, for me to be out there. So yeah, where these people get this stuff from, I don't know, maybe some, some bitter riders and some teams out there that it, Maybe this, this structure didn't quite work for them, but in general, I think it works for most people. And, you know, it, it's a great platform for any privateer to try and start at this level. You know, it's a great, great way to get into it. So that's my take on that. Wow. Oh, that's nice. I appreciate you saying that. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's different fans that think different things and they, their knowledge of things can be different. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's nice of you to say, and I I totally agree. I mean, I it's it's hard for me to I don't want to talk so strongly about Moto America because it doesn't come off very well because I actually work there. But like yourself, I mean, I've lived through I've lived through the good times and the bad times, and uh, and I always tell people I'm like you know uh, I've seen I've seen the AMA, I've seen AMA Pro Racing, I've seen a bunch of people that had the Superbike Series in the past, and if Moto America had this series in those golden years when the money was ample and everybody was making good money and there was the paddock was full of semis and big teams. It, I can't imagine how good it would have been then if it was Moto America who was running that series. So I think, uh, you know, I'm proud of what we've been able to do. And, you know, we, the, the, uh, we, we pulled the thing out of a pretty big, big hole and we're still fighting obviously. And we've got some work to do, but at least we're, we're doing the hard work and we're putting the time in and we're going to make it, uh, we're going to make it good for as many people as we can. So again, it's nice to hear that from, from somebody else. So that's all I've got for today. I know, um, I know David has some appointments for the rest of his day and he's got to get back to his computer and try to figure out how to make <laughs> electronics work. So we will let him go, but thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. And I hope you both had a nice holiday. And uh, happy New Year's to you both, and we'll see you again uh, again shortly when we get rolling. Thanks, Bo. Thanks for being on with us, David. Yep, thanks, guys. Thanks okay. for having me on, and thanks for chatting.